North by Northwest Local and Global Architectural Culture, uh, hosted by the State Library of Queensland as a component of their year-long Asia-Pacific Design Library lecture series. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, M3 Architecture, a medium-sized local practice established in 1997. Michael Banny, Michael Christensen, Michael Lavery and Ben Viel, directors of the practice, uh, will present tonight an overview of the work aimed at defining the mental map of the practice of M3 architecture and the territory as they define it between thinking and building. They argue that this space represents a design facility that enables two-way traffic between the inevitable project idiosyncrasies and immediate practice uh, issues. They've entitled their lecture tonight, Specificity That Surprises. Please join with me in welcoming M3 Architecture. Thank you, Andrew, for your invitation here tonight and for your introduction. Um, since the last time we spoke in a UQ talk series several years ago, much has happened in our office. And most notably, the last few years have been a period of reflection for our practice. And whilst we've continued to make projects, we've also turned our gaze inward in an attempt to better understand our way of working. And we've come to realise uh, that this is not a simple process. And that's for a number of reasons. One of the main ones being that there are many of us who contribute to project direction. Um, there's not a design dictator as such in the office. We have the four of us, and in addition to us, there are seven more in the studio. And a further five or six individuals um, who have drifted away over time for whatever reason over the last 14 years of practice. And all of those people have uh, contributed greatly to, to project direction. So much of what we do is a result of extensive negotiation between all of those people. And whilst this is difficult and often time-consuming, uh, we've come to recognise it as a, as a welcome complexity. So added to this is the overarching theme that is the key to how we practice, um, the constant search for a specificity that surprises. Our belief is that this is the key to any creative pursuit, and by its very definition, it requires a reinvention, another welcome complexity. So what we want to discuss tonight is um, a framework that we begin to understand for ourselves about how, how we work. So firstly, there's the overarching theme. Uh, then we have what we uh, refer to as a loaded diagram. Um, this is a means of capturing information. It's used internally. Uh, it's how we remember and focus what we're doing and our design strategy. It assists us to communicate amongst ourselves um, and provide direction. Now, it's really as formalised as, as these sorts of diagrams that you're going to see tonight, um, which are literally just prepared for these sort of talks. Um, and also, sometimes it's not even a diagram. Sometimes it's just a, a, a snippet of text that's saved to a file. Uh, then we have uh, these series of posters underneath the diagram, um, and they represent our own personal or practice idiosyncrasies. They're the techniques and tendencies that we revert to. Now... Um, each individual poster represents a theme. Um, it's important to realise we don't use all of them. We don't, uh, at the same time, um, we may choose to sort of work with different combinations. And the other issue about these is that is they're probably going to change over time as the makeup of the practice changes. So this is this is where we are now, if you like. So. For us, this is a framework that offers uh, a clarity for how we practice, um, but it also enables complexity. You could imagine differing individuals may choose to work with differing themes to achieve a, a particular project aim. Um, someone else might choose to do it another way. Um, so projects are typically a constant negotiation between all of us in the practice. So tonight, as Andrew mentioned, we're going to talk about uh, this mental map of our practice the territory between our thinking and our building so that you might learn something about the projects as a result. So the title of this talk is um, pretty much key to the way that we practice. And it's not a term that we invented ourselves, but it's a, a, um, a phrase that was introduced to us some years ago. And it is a, um, a, uh, 
praise originally um, accredited to the English literary critic I.A. Richards, who once said that um, what is sought in any creative work is a kind of specificity that surprises. And he said that without this, what we summon up in an audience is a kind of stock response. And he goes on then to cite um, a D.H. Lawrence poem in which readers are put in this kind of improbable position of um, imagining being um, beneath this giant building with enormous columns uh, from the ceiling of which emanate large booming sounds. But there's a concurrent understanding in the poem that this is actually the nostalgic recollection of an adult of being a small child playing underneath a grand piano. And in this kind of literary moment or uh, this literary specificity, if you like, there's quite, a, quite an amazing thing happens, I think, in terms of um, the reader being transported through time or through space, through time in terms of from adulthood back to childhood and back to adulthood again, or through space in terms of from a building to a grand piano and back to a building again and through a range of emotions um, as these um, journeys take place. And for us, um, I think some of the architectural connotations of this are quite palpable in many ways. And for us, in our kind of search for the specificity that surprises us, um, we find this a very useful thing in design process terms, but also because it, in some ways, becomes the DNA of the architecture that results um, coming out the end of the process. Many of you will know uh, this building. This is Red Hill Skate Arena, which was burnt down some years ago now. And um, at the time that it was burnt, there was a DA in on this site uh, for the construction of multi-res on the, on the, on the site. And um, so concurrent with the DA, the, the building was burnt down. And I think, um, if I'm correct, the, the DA was having some difficulty at City Council. And whilst a man was convicted of arson, there was never any connection made between the arsonist and uh, the developer. Uh, this is in my local neighbourhood, and I pass, it, uh, pass by it very, very frequently. And I sit at the traffic lights on Inaugurate Terrace, almost every day and peer in at this um, forlorn site with a sense of um, grief and anger and, and so on. And often um, think about other buildings that, in Brisbane that have um, suffered similar consequences either by um, ignorant legislators or ignorant developers or by accident, in fact. Um, and so as I sit in the car thinking about these sorts of things, it eventually became apparent to me that Skate Arena is actually an anagram of arson attack. <coughs> and this rather Im improbable um, discovery then prompted a look at other uh, culturally significant buildings in Brisbane that have been removed, uh, removed over time to see what their... Um, what their names might be able to suggest back to us. And about at the same time as, as all this was happening, um, quite, quite um, surprisingly, there was a, um, an exhibition on the Gallery of Modern Art entitled Optimism, and we were invited to participate in this um, exhibition by design, through designing a, um, a stage for the opening and closing uh, of the exhibition, as well as a number of live acts throughout the course of the show. And what we proposed uh, for this exhibition was a giant... Um, grave for dead buildings and you can see on this side of the grave all of the um, I don't know if you can see that with the resolution of the screen but um, all of the names of these deceased buildings um, reverently engraved into this large about seven metre high um, marble or plasterboard um, headstone and then on the reverse side of the grave as though these, um, the ghosts of these buildings have kind of risen from the dead and defaced their own um, gravestone to tell the story of, or the impetus behind how they came to be removed from the cultural landscape of Brisbane. And this side of the grave was pretty much blatant propaganda trying to get some sort of message of disgust out there in terms of the, um, the gap that seems to exist frequently between legislators and developers and, um, and how the public realm suffers as a, res as a result. Um, off to the side of this um, oh sorry the, the stage was the set for a number of public events and you can see Dave McCormack and Custard here doing his thing and there was also live chaser broadcasts and so this backdrop was hoped to sort of 
um, get into people's brains a little bit. And off to the side um, of the stage was a, a small lounge area uh, where, we, where mourners uh, at the grave were able to sit and reflect and those who chose to were uh, encouraged to write sympathy cards to the family of the deceased, being the city of Brisbane. <laughs> and across the course of this exhibition, some 2,500 or so cards were um, gathered up, and um, some profound, some, some highly critical. And, um, and I guess this little moment of specificity that happened several <laughs> several months beforehand um, provided the kind of um, catalyst for this quite unusual little project. Similarly, this is a, a small project at um, the University of Queensland in one of the buildings on the Great Court and we were briefed to um, gut this building, uh, gut this room, I mean, uh, take this tiered floor out and turn it into a flat floor, multifunction kind of seminar room space, um, remove all of the fixed um, benches, fixed seating, take down the old blue curtains, put up new blue curtains, take out the old fluoro lights, put up new fluoro lights, etc. There was something about the qualities of this room that um, made this feel wrong to us. And I think um, there's something, something about the fitments in this room that were quite extraordinary. They were neither so blatantly offensive that they deserved to be in the skip but neither were they so outstandingly, obviously wonderful that they deserved to be retained. They were in that delightfully awkward in-between zone looking for someone to love. And so there was concurrent with that a, a kind of a realisation that these desks, um, this another improbable realisation that these desks were the same size and proportion as the windows within the room. So this, um, this prompted a kind of a chain reaction, in a sense, where we thought to ourselves, well, what if the desks became curtains and the hardwood tiered floor became desks and the seats became ceiling panels and then we tenderly repaired the chalkboard and we retained the datum of the ceiling and we kept the rusty chains that were holding up the um, fluoro lights, etc. And... This was not some sort of green agenda in terms of recycling. Um, this was more us trying to um, put forward some kind of point about what we consider to be of value in projects. And in this case, what was considered to be of value was this um, series of strangely attractive fitments that um, had all of the hallmarks of decades and decades of human use the kinds of things that you can't design, but the kinds of things that have such wonderful patina. Um, and so by redeploying them within the space, this, um, the qualities of, of the environment um, would be retained. And one of the really delightful things about, um, about the project to us is that um, when these curtains or desks, whatever you want to call them, sit in the open position, they almost like very, very deep window reveals and the light that comes in through the windows glances across the surface of the desk, highlighting um, decades and decades of graffiti. And um, you can see, maybe you can see, maybe you can't, I, I don't know, you can see someone's um, scratched into the surface here, question everything, to which, uh, this was a science lab, mind you, a lot of smart asses, um, <laughs> question everything, and someone has subsequently scratched why underneath. And, <laughs> and I think this... This is a really kind of profound and fitting end to this tiny little project for us. Um, uh, the idea of questioning everything, even the very idea of questioning everything. Um, and as we go about kind of looking for specificity that surprises, navigating what, what we um, question and what we accept and how we position our practice relative to what we find outside of ourselves in the world. So we've talked about specificity and, uh, and that it relates to things that we find outside of ourselves. And as Mike said a moment ago, we're going to talk in a little while about these things, the things that we um, inherently understand make us up or make our practice up. Uh, but now to spend a little bit of time talking about this the bit in the middle, this loaded diagram, um, I think there's a moment in our design processes where somehow 
the idea of specificity takes some kind of shape and it's either diagrammed or it's a piece of text or it's a conversation that's then formalised into a shape or a model or something. And this is a kind of a very crucial part of the way that we think and work because what happens at this point is that it's the first time that there's a sort of a tangible reality about this kind of specificity um, and that enables other, uh, many people to kind of start clustering around an idea, start critiquing it. It's kind of like putting a stake in the ground, a point of relativity that immediately enables critique and immediately enables people to start layering it with their own idiosyncrasies and, um, and so on. And um, this is not actually the loaded diagram from this project. Those of you who know the project, it's the QT Human Movement Pavilion. This is kind of a diagram of a diagram, and this is shows what happens if you welcome a titan shed into your world and let it, um, let it overtake the formal language and the construction detailing of new work. And it also says something about um, uh, an architectural approach to the non-architectural or, or in fact, um, accepting the unacceptable. In this case, the unacceptable being a commodity advertised by father and son bogans. And <laughs> the, the actual site, as we found it, you can see this wonderful manicured turf and the 400 metre running track and the Titan shed and the light pole. And our brief was to build a building over here somewhere and, um, and it was to contain um, storerooms and toilets and stuff like that, the kind of stuff that you'd imagine serving the field. And the Titan shed already did a wonderful job of housing tractors and ride-on mowers and petrol and all of those um, kinds of things. It's like a mega version of the backyard shed. Um, this was, in fact, one of the diagrams that was produced along the way. And you can see here a pretty, um, pretty clear indication of extending the um, simplistic notion of camouflage that these kinds of backyard sheds have. And in combination with that, um, this long white fascia, about a 45 metre long, four and a half metre high fascia, that was a way of starting to bind together all of these utilities into one, one expression, I guess, um, and a way of enabling all of these very, very pragmatic kind of utilities. Because what we were happy with was the fact that the existing Titan was doing such a wonderful job accommodating the tractors and the mowers and so on, and we were just building dunnies and storerooms and so on. So why not build it onto the end of the Titan instead of building an architectural masterpiece off to one side? But then to um, put together the entire group of utilities, including the light tower, the water taps and so on, bind it all together with this one um, fascia was yet another, uh, p another dimension to the project. And this piece um, enabled the, the project to take on some other roles. Firstly, we're very interested in the, um, the sports pavilion typology, the sports pavilion genre, and the way in which they often have timepieces on their roofscapes um, and the importance of time in sport, first half, second half, under 10 seconds, over 10 seconds and so on. So we wanted um, to abstractly represent this on the fascia and the way that this happened was through the gentle shifting of shadows and the gentle changing of colour by day and by season and so on. And we're also very interested in, the, um, in this project in the, uh, the idea of field position and the importance of field position in sport and um, that feeling of arcing around a 400 metre track or cutting diagonally across a football field and the way in which your peripheral vision and the kind of parallax uh, um, works. And um, so we were very interested in having a portion of this fascia um, engage with those sensibilities when you're on the field. So a small piece of the fascia up the right hand end here um, shifts in tonal quality as you move about this, the field. And you can look, the last thing about this fascia is this diagonal slash, and it does a couple of things. It um, indicates the natural ground line that was here, I don't know, maybe 50 years ago. You can see the natural ground line in the background of Kelvin Grove Road, uh, College Road or something. And so this diagonal inflection in the fascia, fascia sort of nests this building into the topography to some extent, but also in a tongue-in-cheek way just goes, uh, shows just how much civil works and cutting occurred on this field uh, in, all in the name of sport. So this was uh, a complete ex uh, sort of a billboard expression um, 
and really trying to enable this to be the, an elegant utility on a beautifully manicured lawn. But there's something about um, car parking and the fact that um, universities can never have enough cars and this building was suddenly dispossessed of its context um, as the university realised it needed more parking spaces. And so this is a professional photograph which was I quite delight in. It shows the what should have been a turf foreground to the building, which is now a um, bitumen car park, and the kind of um, uh, the contingent nature of architecture of this kind that you just can't take something as important as context away and um, enable architecture like this to survive as a kind of vulnerability about um, architecture of this kind. So recently we were asked to be involved in uh, an ideas competition for Bond University and it's an ideas competition for an architecture school and so what I'd like to do now is just take you through the way in which we built up the loaded diagram for the competition entry that we had. First of all we looked to the site and this building in particular which sits quite prominently in Bond's um, marketing image and it's um, also the, probably the most memorable ex um, building out on that campus. Um, it was designed by Arata Izazaki at a time when he was preoccupied with the idea of ruins and the way in which you could potentially construct a building that uh, referenced the past like a ruin but also suggested a potential future. And we were quite taken by this idea and thought that it may be able to extend into a proposed building that we place on this site. Uh, next we look to the brief. Uh, within the brief there was this idea of a <coughs> forum space within the architecture school and it was to be a space for uh, student breakout, for an artist in residence to inhabit this space and influence the students and for local and international speakers to come and talk to the students and influence them in their own agendas. Um, we, we've shown up here the Roman Forum and we couldn't help but notice the similarities between the Roman Forum and this proposed forum in that it's, um, a, you know, the Roman Forum was a public, public space for public addresses and for the sharing of information. And I, I think that was inherent within the idea of forum within the brief. Um, the other connection that can be made is the sort of um, connection between the Roman forum in this ruinous state and Izazaki's idea of um, Izazaki's preoccupation with ruins. The brief also spoke of um, a way of teaching architecture that was equally between traditional studios and uh, a workshop environment, so hands-on teaching within a workshop. Um, and we felt that this um, pedagogy deserved to be captured spatially somehow. Um, as a unique identifiable um, element within the Bond architecture um, program. Um, and so thinking about Izazaki and the idea of ruins and this forum space and the idea of projecting a hybrid studio workshop environment, um, we struck upon the topology of an archaeological dig site. Um, these are sort of spaces that are um, where ruins are present and where new structures like this scaffold and roof enable studies to occur on those ruins. Um, the archaeological dig sites are places where architecture and culture are discovered and speculations are made. Um, and so we couldn't help but um, be taken by the appropriateness of this topology in, in this particular context um, in a number of ways. Um, firstly, the sort of idea of this broad encompassing roof that that might cover all of the functions within the building and wrap them all up. So this is this idea of binding studios and workshops together spatially. Um, also the light quality that's emitted by these types of roofs, um, quite beautiful and quite suitable to a studio and workshop environment. The other thing that we delighted in was this sort of light weight um, structure and the way in which it engaged with the more heavyweight um, ruin, ruin that sits below it and the way in which that this uh, topology might inform a lightweight building on this campus which was largely sandstone, heavyweight um, based buildings. The scaffold itself um, we saw potential in a studio environment that might be built almost like a gridded scaffold space um, where students could um, 
retreat back into a, their own personal space within a larger building that then they could contemplate their own architectural agendas and have the potential of appropriating this quite transient structure that um, to then represent their own architectural agendas back to the collective within the building. And so as a loaded diagram, this was the image that we presented at Bond um, as, a, as our idea for the competition. Um, unfortunately, we came second in this one, so it really didn't go anywhere. Some people might um, not agree with that, but <laughs> we're saying we came second. <laughs> so, um, five. so next, what we'll do is, as Michael said, we'll just drop below this line here. So we've spoken about the loaded diagram, and we'll now just talk through um, some of these design tendencies and techniques that we've observed of ourselves. And they're in no particular order, and they're used to differing extents in different projects. Um, they also tend to get used to illuminate the specificity that surprises within each project. So firstly, um, the idea of logic, repetition, and complexity is um, an idea that we find both delightful and useful in our work. Um, delightful in the duality of simplicity and complexity that goes along with it, but also useful in its ability as a technique to um, convey information to industry. And it's represented by this diagram here, which we think looks a little bit like the output of a medical diagnostic tool, a flat line going through various stages of life and then back to a flat line. And it represents a building conceptually as well as physically. Physically, as these are 60 cross-sections through the Tree of Knowledge Memorial Project in Barcaldon but also conceptually in that the first and the last sections shown here are representative of the black sarcophagus box that we created for the dead tree relic. Um, and then the interior sections here are hopefully representative of life or the original tree canopy shape in its um, heyday. Interestingly, the, this diagram was never drawn during the construction or even the design of the project it was more often conveyed as this 60 by 60 plan grid of suspended timber members with a level fixing the height of each, each one of these uh, 3,600 sticks. Um, and as a, as a drawing, this denies the complexity of the actual outcome, which you can see here. As that's the interior space, the dead tree sitting in here, and then the view from the outside of the blackened... Um, box that houses the dead tree. To give you another example of the logic repetition and complexity, the Mansard Shaw project at the University of Queensland is a new floor of offices on an existing four-storey building. One of the key ideas explored for this project was that indirect or reflected light is a preferred source of light for all activity and here the ceiling is turned into a series of offset reflectors. So the, the concept of the offset, the logic of the offset reflector and the logic of the reflected light reinforcing the grid of the existing building. Each bay or coffer, uh, sorry, the idea of the reflector is scaled up utilising the logic of the existing structure and repeated in bays, as I've already said, and it creates a ceiling that serves as a source of indirect light through the centre of the entire floor plate. Each bay or coffer differs in long section depending on its proximity to natural light and the potential effects of internal walls, adding yet more layers of variety and complexity within the bounds of the repetition and the logic pursued. So here we see the section and the reflectors with the lights positioned on each structural bay. the centre of the floor plate and the reflectors located, differing in long section in terms of their relation to these internal walls and other spaces and the eventual outcome. And again, in relation to the floor. Extending conventions is, an, is another strategy evident in our work. This poster draws on the connection between conventional construction technique, or craft in this case, and the notion of child's play which occurs in our work, some say more often than it should. 
Two young girls, giants at play, seemingly produce something of enormous scale, the paper wall, designed and built utilising only the repetition of simple craft techniques. Broadly, the idea and we work with the notion that common or conventional ways of building are suitable and often relevant ways of building. However, we recognise that within the realm of the standard building technique, there is room for creativity. Our play with conventional knowledge, extending or breaking convention as required, seeks interest that is expressive of and unexpected in the specifics of a project. Due to the relationship between the event and awards evening, the audience, architects, and the stated brief to communicate cost-effective design, the A1 folded unit is unique to this project. The process to fold each individual unit was also used to produce an illustrated pattern. When backlit, this pattern is made visible as an interconnected graphic within the overall design. Here you see the small folds and the large folds which are printed into each sheet. And those individual A1 sheets and their folded pattern interconnect when all the sheets are placed together. Rows of collapsible sheets allow fast installation in a completed state. And the wall is an example of an unexpectedly large scale paper craft. Here you see the magic of the paper before the folding and the rows ready to install. The printed instructions exist on each and every sheet to convey the concept so people familiar with simple, simple paper folding technique can, can again extend this conventional way of making to build the individual units as well as construct the overall wall. The outcome has since been repeated with several project incarnations in various locations and for a variety of uses, for example, as a backdrop to a wedding or exhibitions, etc. And as stated, when backlit, the wall acts as a large paper lantern. And as noted, the instructions become a visible secondary pattern. The paper wall is a good example of extending conventional ways of making, albeit in this case, utilising craft technique as opposed to traditional building techniques. So in this next example of extending conventions, we were asked to refurbish this existing sports hall at Nudgee College um, to become a drama theatre space. And we began um, looking for inspiration. And one of the things that we were looking at at the time was um, sort of these ornate plaster ceilings that you get, this one from the Capitol Theatre in Melbourne, and trying to figure out a way for us to achieve some of the qualities inherent within these, um, these types of... Um, this type of plaster work, but also knowing that we had a conventional skill set on site um, to try and understand how to actually achieve something like this. And we came across this joyful little um, catalogue full of faux objects made of plaster. And there's an object sort of at the top here that we struck upon, which were these keystone elements, which are typically used um, in, as a faux keystone internally within a building. Um, singularly, and what we chose to do was um, extend the use of this um, beyond its um, faux function to um, a whole of ceiling treatment. So it's used on mass here. Um, you can see it at the top there, um, a bit closer. The, the sort of angular shapes that develop between these hopefully reference um, some of the form of that original building that this fit out is within... So this is an idea about subverting material. In this case, uh, timber is made to feel like a fluid fabric curtain, and this technique relies on a near transformation of the timber. If there were not enough transformation of the timber, it would be too apparent, and if there were too much transformation of the timber in this case, the subversion would be lost on the viewer and the associated enjoyment. This technique is used at the Brisbane North Eye Centre throughout the joinery pieces, which you can see here, um, where we've used standard timber, domestic uh, size sections, handrails, belt rails, um, dados, etc., side by side. And we've capped the ends of these sections to hide the cross-sectional reality so that from the waiting room here, it, it might appear like a curtain, um, that this is... Um, 
contradicted through the solidity felt through touch when you're at the reception desk. There's an interest in how this object might be seen or perceived, particularly in the context of this being an eye clinic. Um, more generally, this idea of um, subverting material is of interest to us because of um, the, the difference between what someone knows and what, someone's, what someone can perceive is, or what someone understands is a meaningful way of engaging, creating engaging qualities within the work. And this is another example here within the, this theatre space at Nudgee College now where the flanking walls here have been created um, with a kaleidoscopic effect that makes them seemingly um, dissolve into a starry night sky, hopefully. Um, and so what happens here is that the kaleidoscope extends singular images and singular pinpricks of light to make these starburst shapes which are ever-changing and extending as you move around. So you might see here a closer image, um, the individual diamond shapes that are placed within this wall treatment, which is actually for acoustic purposes. Often the built environments that we encounter are conventional or unremarkable and sometimes even undesirable. And often what we find in these cases or sometimes um, the best intervention is to actually hype or reinforce the existing qualities of space. In this image here, uh, a laboratory fit-out that we have undertaken. Um, at the end of this internalised corridor, there was a fire door. Um, it's a pretty drab sort of situation. And so what we've done here is um, picked up on uh, the existing grid lines or framework lines within the building and combined them or hyped them together with the perspective of the corridor. Uh, in this image, there's a superimposed image of the of two characters from the uh, Time Tunnel uh, 1960s TV show, um, further exaggerating the perspective in this view. In the actual fit-out, there are concentric rectangles painted on the fire door which make this perspective seemingly extend forever. Um, it's only when you move off axis that the, the, two, um, the two can be read independently and you can sort of understand, understand exactly what has happened there. Another example of the, the hyping theme is, is the Science Learning Centre at um, St Lucia, University of Queensland. So here we chose to hype the expression of the, um, the lighting circuit diagram in oversized galvanised water pipes. And it was a technique uh, that was chosen to achieve a number of things. To provide personalised control and adjustment of the lighting system was, was the most pragmatic level, but um, on a further level, to draw attention to a layer of detail for the inquiring young scientific mind as to what it is that actually goes on behind the skin that is normally hidden just to achieve that level of control um, in the lighting circuitry. And then lastly, um, but probably most importantly, is to provide a, a unique identity for a large and disparate cohort of first-year science students. The Science uh, Learning Centre is, is their space. So 1,500 first-year students at UQ, this is their home base. Um, it, it provides, it, it, it has a unique characteristic and it's very easy for them to describe and identify with uh, as, as a place to, to meet. So the facility here is, it's a next generation learning space, um, a, a social learning space designed to provide peer-to-peer -peer learning in an environment very similar to what Hamilton was talking about um, two weeks ago in this series. Another theme um, that occurs quite regularly within our office is what we call the extraordinary. It's the celebration of ordinary building materials and it's not, not just brick as the two examples that we're just about to show to describe this theme, but anything from the galvanised pipes in that previous project to timber mouldings at the Chermside Eye Surgery or even the plaster um, keystones at Nudgee College. So in our local context, there's nothing more ordinary than the suburb, uh, or suburban than the humble brick. Um, nevertheless, it's still possible to look at the common brick for cues to open up the brick up to new possibilities, both literally and metaphorically. 
it's also possible to see the potentials alive within the common brick and to begin to work with bricks in a different, very different manner. Um, the, the complexity of the extruded brick, um, it, it's a lost quality. So if we choose to bolster cut that brick in different locations, um, either longwise or, or in the short direction, and lay those bricks with the cut face uh, facing out as either a standard or a header course, exposing what is normally concealed, um, and then choosing to lay them in a defined pattern, there becomes a shift in the perception of the capability of the ordinary brick. So this poster represents the bricks and the building as inseparable elements. It depicts the building as a veneer to the brick. It illustrates what is possible in a common prosaic brick veneer construction by looking beyond the veneer itself. So the resultant building on the left sits within the context of a series of 1970s uh, brick buildings which are in themselves entirely prosaic, but now they're lifted by the new work. Sorry, wrong way. But in reality, um, it's just an ordinary brick venereal construction method. Um, not too dissimilar to your standard A.B. Jennings home in the Burbs. Steel studs, sorry, steel studs, um, ply bracing, sarking, brick veneer. Simple construction. Continuing this discussion about ex extraordinary things, <clears throat> or ordinary in the first instance, there's a fairly common perception of um, bricks, I think, uh, building product. You can get it from hardware stores or home centres, um, and magically the bricks arrive at your site in whatever colour you choose. I th we we um, were of the opinion for a while that people have lost sight of the fact that bricks um, are earthly materials. They come out of, out of the ground and that their colour is region-specific. And though it's quite a subtle thing, the, um, the colour and tone of bricks varies from southern states up through the northern states, generally with the lightning as you, the further you go north. And in this um, competition submission for the Think Brick um, competition some years ago, what we really wanted to do was two things. One thing was to try to highlight the um, stupidity of trucking heavy bricks around Australia from a green perspective. And secondly, we hoped that we might um, somehow enable people to see the delight in understanding that your building, your home, your building is made of um, local earth. So what we set about doing was choosing a, a, um, a site in generic Brisbane suburbia and after we'd done that, we looked um, at reconstruct reconstructing in brick two contemporary visions of um, Australian landscape. So the first one, an Arkley vision of um, the built environment. And what we did in reconstructing this in masonry was we allowed ourselves to choose bricks from anywhere in Australia. And so through expending some four tonnes of CO2 emissions we managed to um, reconstruct this Arkley uh, in a manner like this, which um, has, has the effect of going full circle. So this hyper-real Arkley vision of this Australian suburban landscape goes full circle back to this quite ordinary... Um, the sort of vision of this um, Australian built landscape that you'd have if you drove out to the Burbs. And um, conversely, this wonderful Fred Williams' vision of the natural Australian landscape reconstructed using brickwork from the local source. And what we think happens in this is that this is a much more satisfactory depiction of um, an original. And what this simple exercise tried to illustrate was the fact that um, uh, limiting things has some desirable effects. So li limiting people's choices to the local t may have the effect of actually taking a generic kind of um, building material and transposing it through to something extraordinary um, by romanticising it somehow. I think um, many of us here would be familiar with that sensation of being drawn right into an Escher print through the seeming tangibility but then um, 
to find yourself turned upside down and inside out and back to front because of the impossible perspective and the eternal connectivity of some of these kinds of prints. But these kinds of um, spatial complexities are obviously impossible and uh, anything near them is seldom found in um, our all too pragmatic real world. But sometimes what we think happens is that um, the most pragmatic response to um, pragmatic client needs results in such peculiarity sometimes as to be surprising. And this image is actually a mash-up between Brisbane Girls Grammar School Creative Learning Centre void space and an Escher print. And in the actual Girls Grammar project, the building traverses some six storeys of um, topography. And there was a, um, an intent in this project to, to allow each floor level to connect to natural ground, which had a three-dimensional complexity in its own right. And laid on top of that, we were able to reasonably predict common paths of travel and likely socialisation patterns of the students. And these added further levels of complexity to the, um, to the three-dimensional outcome. And I think what we often find ourselves doing in, uh, as architects working particularly in design construct projects is that we, um, it's hard competing with um, adolescent girls at times, I find, but um, what we find that we do many times in working in these sorts of environments is presenting our thoughts through pragmatic frames of references, knowing full well that the outcome is likely to be perceived in a way, any other, in any other way than pragmatic terms. This is a little clip that um, the students at Girls Grammar put together for their um, uh, anniversary. And you've got to go through this excruciating Hall of Notes bit before you get to the um, really, really good bit at the end. Maybe. Next door at Boys Grammar School is an example, another example for us of this um, pragmatic poetic duality that we find in our work. Um, this was uh, part of a competition that we entered at Boys Grammar for their new library. And we had to propose to retain this existing historic avenue of fig trees that runs along the edge of their site. Um, so this quite pragmatic decision to retain these fig trees informed um, both the siting of our building, which sits here hard up onto the road edge, um, and also this facade <coughs> line, which quite accurately, or close to accurately, trace the drip line of these existing trees in an effort to retain them. And this quite pragmatic decision to retain trees leads to this, um, was the objective basis for this otherwise irrational dancing facade, which forms the main spatial experience in this atrium. That's another competition we came second on. Correct. So when there is cause to be provocative, um, we often find that displacement is a useful tool. Um, in this case, a curtain placed alongside an eight-lane eight roadway. Um, in this case, um, this is the facade of the Brisbane North Eye Centre, um, which displaced the much-loved Dawn Theatre in Chermside. Um, so this... This facade references um, the past use, the theatre for movies, and the proposed use here, which was the theatre for day surgery. <laughs> and the actual outcome here is a dis the displaced curtain element. Um, we've, we often use this technique at the scale of materials and finishes, but also at the scale of whole building elements, as you can see here. This is a, um, another example of this displaced object idea. Um, the Gold Coast Arts Centre, and you can see the Arts Centre in the centre of the screen there, just on the edge of um, the lake. And this was a commission to um, the, the 
granosite coating on the fly tower was cracking, so they needed to scaffold the building to repair it and repaint it. And they thought they'd take the opportunity to see if some bright spark had a fantastic idea of decoupage on a grand scale to um, create some more definitive identity than uh, a plain white fly tower. So we began research into um, the cultural landscape of the Gold Coast, um, the history of the arts at the Gold Coast, parallels drawn between the Gold Coast and other cities that are strip-planned, um, motorcar-centric kind of environments. It was through that kind of process that we started looking with some interest at um, signs and billboards and, um, and light fittings and all manner of other um, roadside paraphernalia. And um, we were enamoured by the convex uh, stainless steel roadway mirror. And what we came upon was the idea that this might be deployed by the hundred to use to, um, to, to place all over this fly tower. And you can see the way in which it, these stainless steel elements sit as a, uh, a layer on top of a charcoal filigree graduated in tone from dark at the top to light down the bottom, eventuating in white so, the, so that this element um, kind of uh, graduated back into the, the entire building. And this, in our mind, ha has the kind of feeling of a matinee jacket for a, a building or a kind of um, glow mesh shawl. It has its kind of um, evening moods and its um, daytime moods. It's got some way of referencing Gold Coastness without being explicit somehow. It says, look at me, but yet reflects its surroundings. And um, these, these stainless steel mirrors are somehow at home in the giant car park that surrounds it, yet have gone on to do something else with their lives through uh, their use in this way. So we won that competition, but we were the only entrant. And so the council, <laughs> the council had a bit of a problem with it, and unfortunately it hasn't been built. Um, this, this is a slightly confusing image. Is this a, a dress taking over the facade of a building or a facade clothing a female model? Is this image somehow trying to um, be political? This is a, an all-girls school, placing a female image in front of an all-girls school. Is it trying to be um, slightly provocative because this is a school commonly thought of as a feminist girls' school? Is this an offensive image? Is it funny? Or is, it, um, or is this actually just um, some sort of coincidence? In fact, this is exactly what it is. It's purely here to make the point that in our work, multiple interpretations are often encouraged and sought, and sought after. And what you see here is the um, west facade of Brisbane Girls Grammar School and an extract from a My catalogue that arrived uh, a couple of years after the completion of the project. So the facade is actually the, um, or the interference pattern is the in the facade, is the coalescing of the sunscreen on the left and the fibro black and white painted inner wall um, of the building. And whilst the curvilinear um, pattern of the facade is derived approximately from the foundation building, the um, the wonderful kind of arched fenestrations and the, um, the, the, veran the, the decorated veranda. Um, the proposal stops short of, of kind of explicitly referencing its fundamental role, apart from shading the building, is to engage people in motion. So um, taxi drivers, truck drivers, kids in the back seats of cars, um, boys on the adjacent playing field and so on. And what we what we find in terms of this sort of idea of multiple interpretations is that sometimes in architecture, in our opinion, sometimes in architecture when a message is too cryptic, it might, um, it might appeal to too exclusive an audience. If it's too obvious, it might um, tire too quickly. So what we try to achieve in our work is somewhere between these two poles so that we end up with um, results that are broadly engaging and mean different things to different people at different times. Another example of a, mul uh, of a project that utilised multiple interpretations is um, this competition entry for Captain Cook's landing site in Botany Bay, Sydney. 
And rather than moralising the events of 1788, our strategy here was to provide cues for interpreting those events. So the proposal is that out in the bay, 17 of these sort of dark stone protrusions, and when viewed from most positions, these forms are mysterious and foreign, hopefully engendering a sense of confusion felt by both the original inhabitants of the country and Cook's party at the time of his arrival from the land. And yet, as you get closer to the privileged position of where Cook actually came ashore, the alignment of the protrusions seen on the image on the right um, forms the silhouette of Cook's ship, the Endeavour. So this moment provides the opportunity for multiple interpretations of this installation by the viewer. Only a couple more to go, guys. Okay. So the last, uh, this, this particular theme being explicit. The saying, the elephant in the room, refers to an issue large and present, but unspoken. In this poster, this is an elephant in a room, or with the understanding that it's a mirrored wall, the elephant is actually standing somewhere just behind us, confronting thought in such a small domestic garden setting. In our work, we... Uh, there is a preference for finding the elephant and working with it, making it visible and formalised. Often this resides in the state of affairs or the specificity and its presence in the architectural outcome. In this case, it was the client's preoccupation with a rear garden resulting in a pavilion designed to extend the perception of landscape from common paths of travel. So the inclusion of the elephant in the image references the saying and it contributes to the wilderness quality of the garden. In making the chosen state of affairs explicit, there is a will to connect people with the architectural agenda at play in the work. Being explicit, I've gone too far. The context for the Centre of Marine Studies Laboratory fit out was to work with and highlight a very low budget set by the client. The approach sought to treat the existing fit out with its suspended ceilings, common steel stud, plasterboard and vinyl floor as if it were precious. Regardless of the removal of walls, the ceiling plane and bulkheads were retained. Likewise, floor finishes were kept where possible, carefully patched and repaired tenderly as one would in precious heritage work. In a heritage building, retention is usually associated with the preciousness of fabric for social, cultural or historic reasons. Here it was purely about cost. The detailing of the new insertions in one bold colour and the capping of pre-existing materials at the junction where the removal has occurred makes this approach explicit in the fabric of this new fit-out. So quite clearly here we see the new insertions as and where exactly they were, were required and the existing bulkheads and ceilings retained to save money and the obvious capping of the work that was retained allowing this kind of archaeological uh, treatment of the site and being able to follow what was there before and what, in fact, was new. The last of our recognised techniques is titled humour. Practice as a whole is generally a serious endeavour and where possible we look for ways to be irreverent, absurd, ironic and overtly obvious. Hopefully you've already seen that. SAP asked us to design a tea towel for its range of architect design tea towels. In thinking about this as an, as an actual project, we sought a site, considered its practical and social implications, the tea towel specificity, if you will, and looked for a way to express these conditions. In our search for a site, we realised that the home for most tea towels, when not asleep in the drawer, is on the oven door. On the oven, it acts as a kind of screen. If something is in there, you might not know. What if the tea towel was screening something wonderful and savoury? If this were true, what if the tea towel could give the impression that this wonderful, savoury thing was present all the time? The chicken tea towel was born. <laughs> An obvious fake that pokes fun at our wants and obsessions. Watch out for the cupcake tea towel coming soon. Other projects contain this sense of playfulness. Mike spoke earlier about the Human Movement Pavilion at QUT, 
which built an extension of shed-like qualities around an existing shed. Shortly after the completion of the project, maintenance staff at QUT added this letterbox to the new building, which had its own shed-like undesigned charm. So, in the spirit of the project, we decided to propose to QUT an addition. <laughs> and finally, here at Magnetic Island, after exhausting every other opportunity for design input on a mixed-use development, we proposed a series of na naval flag screens for the apartments, which were to be located above a pub and a shopping centre. The flags form the sentence from the book Treasure Island, and they read, this is a handy cove and a pleasant situated grog shop. <laughs> With the words grog shop finishing directly above pub. This reflection on our work and the ideas and methods that sit behind it has necessarily required us to be detailed and incremental in building up an understanding of ourselves. We have illustrated themes and approaches and then provided evidence as to their existence in the project work. And whilst it is possible to break project down... Break, 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 <laughs> whilst it's possible to break microphones... We've already finished the human bit. ..and break projects down into bits and break the practice up into parts, as we have, we hope it is now also possible to gain a feel for an overall complexion of the practice, an overall feeling that perhaps is greater than the sum of its parts. Perhaps this is best summarised by a recently completed project, the Yurong Pili Bridge. The poster for this project is a fusion between a Warren truss and the sole of the Dunlop Volley tennis shoe. It is both a shoe print as well as an embellishment of a standard engineered structure. Here we see the truss hidden away inside the array of repeated shapes. The context of the local area included many examples of this structural typology. The Pat Rafter Tennis Arena with its own exposed trusses and the... Ex this being the tennis arena, obviously. And, uh, not by us. <laughs> no, not by us. And, uh, of course, these railway bridge typologies which exist everywhere. There's a QR site and a road or a rail line to be bridged. The design, for the, uh, the design for the proposed bridge had already begun before we were engaged and the same truss was already proposed. The Dunlop Volley was the tennis shoe of choice for tennis champions such as Ken Rosal and Yvonne Goulagong Corley and thousands of young Aussie kids emulating their heroes. It is an icon associated with the glory days of Australian tennis. And here, in the bridge's interior, as part of the arrivals and departure experience, we have explored some of the joy and detail of the shoe and its associations with tennis, the outdoors, grass sports and Australian leisure more generally. This project represents the kind of specificity that interests us and hopefully you will agree, the kind of specificity that surprises. Thank you. I was just going to ask a question about the uh, decorative strategies you have and I just wanted to ask if uh, the contractors and the you know, builders and stuff, how do they react to your decorative strategies or, or is that a way for them into your side of the project or I just wonder if you've got any comments about their reactions. Do you say the builders? Yeah, the people who make the things that you you've designed. got to really hide it in the documents, and that's what, um, like, <laughs> like the tree of knowledge. Um, there's no way we would have drawn all those sections because the tender would have been double what it was. It was just a single reflected ceiling plan with some RLs. So it's and, really and one detail. Just, and one detail. <laughs> <laughs> so you just you're tendering it. There's three thousand six hundred sticks. They're all this long. It's easy, and you just hang them at the right height. But conversely, the brick 
the brick building at Gatton. I think there were three brick layers um, who walked off the job before the last one stayed. But, but, but in that example, the, um, Ashley here somewhere. I mean, his his drawings of the of the pattern were so detailed that there was it, it ended up becoming really easy once <laughs> once they hung around for a little bit and were able to learn, what, you know, how easy it was. So the original guy that started it actually came back and finished that job. You know, the, the first guy ended up being the guy that finished it. So I think it's, it's a challenge. I think it's a, a two-edged sword as well because. Um, Without, without those things, there isn't anything. So the builder can't not do it, if you know what I mean. They have, uh, there'd be vast swathes of our projects that appear incomplete without, <laughs> without the discipline of building it properly. I think broadly, broadly speaking, though, generally people recognise immediately the challenge of these things. I mean, we don't really hide them away in the documents, and Mike's being a bit facetious there. But... The really good contractors and the, and the good subcontractors, however they feel about when the project starts, when it's finished, they have a real sense of ownership about it, and that's something that really gives a lot of joy. You know, that, that you're um, working with people who want to do something that challenges their own knowledge, and that and that notion of extending conventions is very much a part of that. I think. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, this is not. a question. It's nice to ask now, after you've just answered one question by, in a sense, calling up the values of uh, subterfuge as part of an explanation. But in order to ask the question, I need to be very direct about some complementary things, because this is such a relief to hear people speak about their work in this place not from the point of view of its romance, colonial potential or its lifestyle, but in terms of a, a, a genuine interest in a very world set of things that are beautifully explained, incredibly well graphically illustrated and then beautifully built. So it's extremely good work and it's not like a lot of other Brisbane work, uh, including our own, which is caught up in, oh, what is this Brisbane thing? So my question is... Th thank you. Th thank oh, you, the next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because we, we always win the third prize. Um, <laughs> uh, my, my, my question is, in order to make someone like you, who our city ought to be very proud of, and you ought to be very forward about yourselves... When you speak about these things, why do you use such a kind of eulogistic, almost sad tone. <laughs> so that, for instance, you know, you didn't really want to admit to the builder. No one really quite knows the marvel of a brick. You know, the geography line that was running through the building got sad. It could have been the other colour, but darn, it wasn't. So, because that same sense of how everything that goes on is a sort of a, a loss and a Sadness. And <laughs> why adopt that position when you're doing such good work? Is it, and this is the question, A, because, <laughs> <laughs> which you can answer in a flash, it's multi choice, each person can choose a different one. Is it A? It's A. <laughs> a, because you feel that by pursuing what it is that you're pursuing, that you feel either alone from your profession or alone from your society? Is it B? Because you think that it's not really an efficacious position and you shouldn't be forward about it? Or is it C, that you think that actually one of the remaining things that you do have as part of being in the Brisbane way is that somehow you can't be on the front foot and extremely proud almost pushy about what you're doing instead of having to apologise for it. I think it's much simpler than that. We're more practised at um, drawing and building than we are at public speaking. And... <laughs> Practice is too tiring when you try to do complicated things. <laughs> 
I, I think it's a good question, Timothy, but I, I don't know that we're going to be able to answer it in, in one go. We might have to see you later. Hmm. Our next week's speakers are Stevens Lawson's Architects from Auckland. <coughs> but before um, we think about that too much, could you please join with me in thanking M3 Architecture? <laughs>